As I think about the events that transpired in Nashville, Tennessee just a couple of hours ago, with the shooting at the Burnett Chapel congregation, there is no doubt that it was a terrible tragedy. Every single day, it seems, we hear of tragedies, we see on the news of tragic, tragic events, whether it's abroad, somewhere else in the world, somewhere here in the United States, or somewhere close to home. Tragic events are always occurring. We've all experienced tragedy in our life. You know, we, we lose loved ones to death. That is tragedy. It is tragic. You think about tra other tragedies, such as losing out one's possessions to natural disasters. Look at what Hurricane Harvey did to the Houston area. You look at what Hurricane Irma did to Florida. And the damage it caused, the disaster and the havoc they wreaked, is truly tragic. You look at the, the, the earthquake in Mexico, all natural disasters. And we, and we often wonder, why? A lot of the questions we ask, we simply cannot know the answers for because we're not God. But from a human perspective, we might ask the question, why? Why do bad things happen? One of the bases for the, our discussion this afternoon is a song we often sing, Farther Along. And I want to title the lesson this afternoon, and I farther along. You know, you think about the song, and we're going to base our study off the lyrics to this song, and as we seek to understand why bad things happen, why tragedy occurs, how we can overcome with it, how we can deal with it, how we can overcome it. Because a lot of times, as I think about the devil, our adversary, and he is our adversary. Peter describes him in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, as being a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, do you realize the devil's not after the world this afternoon? Do you realize he's after you and he's after me? The devil already has the world in his back pocket. He's not worried about the world. He wants... But when he does care about the world is when we, go to when we go and preach the gospel. He wants to keep the world in his back pocket. No, he's seeking you and me. And one tool that he uses to try to destroy the Christian's faith in God, in Christ, to destroy our hope, to discourage us, to depress us, to dissuade us from living the Christian life, is tragedy. Tragedy. How many in here know of individuals, know of brothers and sisters in Christ this afternoon who have simply given up on God because of tragedy? It happens. So what can we do? What, what do we need to know about tragedy? How can we handle it? How can we overcome it? These are some of the questions we want to consider in this lesson. What should we do? What should our response be in the time of tragedy. And indeed, when we look to the events, when we consider the events that have transpired in Nashville, it is tragic beyond belief, um, to the point almost. <clears throat> Never in my wildest imagination would I, would I ever think that a congregation of the Lord's people would be affected by a mass shooting. But today, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it has happened. We have to face that reality. Do you realize it could have been here? It can happen anywhere. Tragedy can strike anywhere. So we need to understand it. We need to understand the devil's going to use every tool at his disposal to try to defeat you and me, to try to destroy our faith. And so this afternoon, first of all, as we think about this lesson, as we think about the need to consider things farther along, as we think about the need to keep tragedy, how to handle tragedy, 
How to have the proper perspective. Number 753 is the page in which farther along is found in the book. So if you want to follow along in the song book as we break these words down, I encourage you to do that. But the song starts right off with the basic problem we, the, that we are dealing with today, this afternoon. Tempted? We're all tempted. We all have to be, we are all tempted to sin. Even Christ Himself, look there in Matthew chapter 4, Christ was tempted in the wilderness. The Hebrews writer teaches us in Hebrews chapter 4 that Christ was tempted in all like points as we are. So Christ knows what we are going through. He knows that we are tempted on every hand. He knows that we are going to be faced with the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And I would suggest to you, how does the devil use tragedy to tempt to lure us away from God, to destroy our faith? He uses it in the form of the pride of life. You're going through bad times. You're experiencing bad things, and yet you're God, the God you want to serve, the God you claim to serve, the God you claim to love, is allowing you to go through these things. Why would you want to serve a God like that, the devil is asking. Too many times, it's cr too many times we don't know why bad things happen. Part of the reason is because of our own choices. Because of choices, tragedies happen. You know, when Adam and Eve chose to sin in the garden, it changed everything, did it not? Sin entered the world. Death entered the world. We are creature, individuals. We are created by God with free will. The ability to choose free moral agency. Sometimes our choices are wrong, obviously. When we choose to sin, when we choose to give in to temptation, we are making the wrong choice, are we not? But when we choose to say no to sin, we are making the right choice. Choices have consequences. Sometimes we make the wrong choice and it affects others. Sometimes it just affects ourselves. Sometimes it has long-reaching consequences. But I would also suggest to you as well that we can be affected by the choices of others. Bad things can happen because of the choices of others. You know, you think about the individual who goes out and gets drunk and then gets behind the wheel of a car. And then they get out on the road and they, and they strike another vehicle, an innocent vehicle, a family, perhaps. And you think about lives that are needlessly lost due to drunk driving. Think about the, fa the families that are impacted by the choice of an individual to get behind the wheel intoxicated. That's a bad choice that affects far other people. Think about the incident today in Nashville. We do not know the motive of the individual. We don't know the mindset of the individual who came to the church building there with a gun, armed. We don't know his mindset, their mindset, but we do know they were, but we do know they were out to do evil. We don't know what motivated them to carry a gun and to open fire and to shoot seven other people. And as we just mentioned, that resulted thus far in the loss of one life needlessly. We don't know all of this. We do know that the choice that they made brought tragedy to many others. Many others were affected by the choice that that individual made to go and shoot other people. You think about the choices of Adam and Eve that, that they made when they gave in to temptation, brought death into the world. Death's passed upon all men. We all are going to die physically. Hebrews 9, 27. But we don't have to die spiritually. We don't have to give in to temptation. We can make the right choices on that. But yet, you think about the next phrase, tempted in tried. You know, it's the idea of test being tested. 
Again, the Peter has something to say about this in 1 Peter chapter 1. And verse 6. Exhorting these Christians, he says, you're, you know, he tells them, Rejoice though now for a season if need be. Ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations or trials. Now look at verse 7. Now why? Why is Peter exhorting this? That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You see, tragedy is a test of our faith. You think about the brethren, you think about what our brothers and sisters in Christ are going through at Nashville today. This afternoon. Their faith is being put to the test, is it not? They are being tested. But you see, God says this testing can have a purpose, a beneficial purpose. You're going to pass through the fiery trials of faith. And yes, I know, we don't understand everything that goes on in this world. We don't understand why we are, be why we are tried. There's another song that we often sing. Trials dark on every hand and we cannot understand. And there are times we don't understand. But we do know that our faith will be tried. You look at Job. You go back to the book of Job. You look at the example of Job. And you tie this in with what the next point in our song. Tempted and tried. We're off made to wonder. Why it should be thus all the day long. Again, as you think about trials, we, we think about why why we're going through these and while some others are not. You know, we may think other people have it all together and I preached a sermon on this. Do we really have it all together? We think people are all perfect. But no, we all face our struggles. Everyone goes through struggles. Even the Apostle Paul. Read 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He had to deal with a thorn in the flesh. Even in the midst of his trials, even when Paul beseeched God to remove his thorn, Three times. Christ's response was, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. You see, Christ is strong. He is our strength. I am weak, but He is strong. How did Paul handle his difficulties? How did Paul handle his trials? By relying upon God. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Oh, it's so easy to quote Philippians 4.13. That's an encouraging verse, is it not? But you think about the context. Think about where Paul was when he spoke those words. He wasn't experiencing tragedy, but he was experiencing a trial of faith. He was imprisoned in Rome. And yet, even in a Roman prison, Paul was saying, I can well, you can do what, Paul? I can do all things that God wants of me through and in Christ who is my strength. You know, when we think face tragedies, when we, when we are perplexed about things that are going on around us, we need to look to God. You look, look at Job. You think about this man. He, we think he had it all together. He was perfect, upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil. In fact, we're told he offered up sacrifices for his own children day after day. But yet, Job lost everything. You, you want to talk about someone who experienced tragedies? Look at Job. And I think that's what makes Job such a practical study during such a time as this. Because Job can relate. Job lost his belongings, his material possessions. You read this in Job chapter 1. He lost his children. And in fact, he even lost his health. You go on into chapter 2 when you see him sitting there in sackcloth and ashes with the bulls all over his body and he's scraping himself with a piece of pottery. And I would even suggest as well that Job lost his wife. Remember what Miss Job told him? She looked at his situation and she said, Job, why don't you just curse God and get it over with and die? Just curse God and die, Job. 
But you remember what Job told her? He said, shall we receive good at the hand of God and shall we not receive calamity? And we're told in all this did not Job sin with his lips. Did Job understand everything that was going on? As we think about here in the, in the, song, in the lyrics to Farther Along, did he, was he made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long? You go throughout the book and you will find that, yes, Job did not understand. Job was perplexed. Job was confused. And certainly Job asked questions. But yet he never charged God foolishly. He repented at the end of the book, yes. But he never completely lost his faith. You look at Job. You look at the, the, re, the reality is, why do we face tragedies in this life? Why do we face trials? You think about Satan's question of Job chapter 1, verse 10. Job, Job, Satan asked God, Hast, thou made not, hast not thou made a hedge about him and his, about his house and about all that he hath on every side? You bless the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But if you put forth your hand right now, God, and touch all he hath, he will curse thee to thy face. You see what Satan's doing here? You see what Satan's trying to do? He's trying to claim to God. He's trying to accuse God. He's trying to claim... God, the only reason Job and his family are serving you is because you fenced him in. You take away that fence of protection, he'll curse you. He won't serve you. You take away all he has, and, and he won't serve you what, at all. As Christians today, God has not placed, us, placed a hedge around us. He didn't place a hedge around Job. Job was tested. But we also learn from the book of Job. And when he came forth, he came forth like as unto gold. And that's what the trials of faith can do for us. It can purify us. It can refine us. And help us come forth as gold. Stronger people. We need to recognize, though, Satan is hard at work. But then he'll use the other tactic. While there are others living about us, never molested, though in the wrong, as we've already pointed out. You know, not every, no one has it completely all together. Every single person living in the world has his or her own problems. Why do people look up to Hollywood celebrities? And the reason being is a lot of people look to them and say, they've got it made, they're perfect. You look at the tabloids, though, and you can see all sorts of problems of celebrities. They're worse off than we are. The majority of them li live life without God. Many in our society live life without God because they claim there is no God. As Christians, we don't have an easy life. There's no doubt about it. But we enjoy the good life the abundant life in Christ Jesus. May we never forget that. Amen. We should never forget the good life we have in Christ Jesus. Think about this. Think about how blessed we are. Ephesians 1, 3. We enjoy all spiritual blessings in, found only in Christ Jesus. Why is that? Because we're in Christ. You think about those so-called perfect celebrities. Do they enjoy, do the majority of those, vast majority of them enjoy the forgiveness of sins? Have they been reconciled unto God? Yes, we have t difficulties in life, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, but never forget the blessings we enjoy in Christ Jesus when we, when we wonder about these things. And yes, there are many times in life we wonder why are bad things happening? happening. Some things are just natural disasters. Some things are out of our control, but yet, as we've already discussed, some things are due to choices. Our own choices and the choices of others. But if we trust God, if we look to His book, if we rely on prayer, we can overcome. And that's why we plead with all. When faced with difficulty, when faced with tragedy, turn to God. But not just in tragic times. In the good times as well, at all times, at all circumstances of life. 
Satan wants, wants people to blame God for their problems. We should never blame God. Instead, we should learn to depend on God, trust God. Perhaps one of the most reassuring promises is this. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Hebrews 13, 5, Josh, and that was quoted from Joshua 1, verse 7. God told Joshua that himself. God knows what we're going through. There's, there's an all-seeing eye watching us right now. God knows what the brethren in Nashville are going through. He sees their pain. He sees their tears. And He sees what we go through. And that is why He said, Cast all your cares upon Him, for He careth for you. 1 Peter 5, verse number 7. Does Jesus care when my heart is pained? Yes, He does. Absolutely. God cares. And that's why He encourages us. That's why He invites us to cast our cares upon Him. I've talked about this before. I talk about the invitation of Christ, Matthew 11. And, and a lot of times we look about Christ saying, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and say, Well, that just applies to non-Christians or erring Christians. No, no, no. There's an application for you and I, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, as faithful Christians. What happens when we're pressed down with the cares of this life? What happens when we are faced with trials and with difficulties? We're faithful, remember. What does Christ say? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Well, how do we as faithful Christians come unto Christ? By casting our cares upon Him. Well, why do we do it? Again, because He cares. He'll give you rest. Again, as Christians, when we take our burdens, our cares to the Lord, we'll, we'll find more peace of mind. You think about what the Hebrews writer says in Hebrews chapter 4. The exhortation to come before the throne of grace boldly. The idea here is pray. Why should we pray? And so, in fact, we might say the invitation of Christ to, to, to His faithful is, you need to pray. Come unto me. Come, take, take your cares to me. Take them to the Father through me. Pray. Cast your cares. I can handle them. I will remove the burden. Throw your burden on me. Well, why do we do it? Why do we need to do it in light of Hebrews 4.16? Well, the Hebrews writer says, you come before the throne of grace boldly to find grace to help in time of need. And a tragedy is a definite time of need, is it not? We can find grace to help us get through tragedy. Again, you go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And remember God, what Christ said to Paul. And we remind ourselves again, My grace is sufficient for thee. And we need that grace. And so when we go to God in prayer as His children, we can find grace to help us in time of need. That's what we need to do when we are tempted and tried, when we are perplexed. So that's the question. That's the question of tragedy, we might say, here. But then secondly, how do we handle it? Well, that's where the first, second verse comes in. By being faithful till death, said our loving Master, by living a faithful Christian life, that's how we handle, that's how we handle tragedy in life. You, you look at Job, again, a great example of one who remained faithful to God. And what did he do when facing tragedy? You look at chapter 1, <laughs> verses 20 and 21. After he lost his belongings, lost his children, he rent his mantle, shaved his head, fell down upon the ground, and worshipped. He worshiped God. Now look at what he declared in verse 21 in chapter 1 of the book bearing his name. He says, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. 
God has gave, and God has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job sought opportunity to glorify God. You think about another example of leaning on God, of, of, of showing one's faith in God, of being faithful unto God, is, is David. And we understand David as a man after God's own heart. He was not sinless, was he? He committed some terrible sins. You look at the sin of Bathsheba there in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12, and we see just how far David fell from God. But we also know how that David was a king, was a man after God's own heart because David had a heart that was tender and receptive to repentance. Despite David's sins, we will learn from this chapter and from Psalm 51, David had a willingness to, to repent. He wanted to please God. We understand one of the consequences of David's sin was the child that was born in his adulterous action with Bathsheba. And we understand that the child, that the child would ultimately die. die. And so when David was told the chi child was dead, in 2 Samuel 12, 20, we're told that he arose from the earth, indeed a time of tragedy. He arose, washed, anointed himself, changed his apparel, came into the house of God, and worshipped God. Then he came to his own house when they required. They set bread before him and he did eat. And the servant said unto him, What is this thing you have done, king? You didn't fast and weep for the child while it was alive, but when the child you fasted and weep for the child when it was alive, but when the child is dead, you're now rising and eating bread. And notice David's response. How he handled his tragedy. How he showed faith in God. He said. Yes, while the child was alive, I fasted, I wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? That's faith, is it not? He depended on God. He knew, that he knew it was in God's hands. Now look at verse, verse 23. Now he's dead. Wherefore should I fight fast? Can I bring him back again? And David's saying, I can't. He's in essence saying, no, I can't bring him back again. I don't have that power. I'm not God. Now look at this. I love this last statement. David says, I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Isn't that wonderful? You think about faithful Christians who pass away from this life, whether it's natural causes or due to tragedies. You know, as a Christian today, we, you know, when we lose loved ones, when we lose loved ones who are faithful to the Lord, we should, we, we, we should resolve to say, I shall go to them. Should we not? How do I overcome? How do I handle my tragedy? I can go to them. If we have loved ones that are not faithful to the Lord, that makes it all the more urgent that we preach the good news of, and teach them the good news of salvation, is it not? And plead with them to obey the gospel. But we need to be faithful. We need to cling to God as Job, as David did. We need to hold to God's unchanging hand. We need to build our hopes on things eternal. Because we have a few more days to labor and wait. And indeed... Life is but a few more days. We don't know what lies on the morrow. For what is your life? It is but a vapor that appeareth for a little while and then quickly vanisheth away. James 4, 14. We don't know when death will come. And so as Christians, when faced with trials, we just need to keep laboring. We just need to keep waiting on the Lord. And He'll renew our strength. Isaiah 40 and verse 31. Because then if we are faithful unto death, toils of the road will then seem as nothing. If we hang in there and we overcome, if we're faithful unto death, Christ will give us the crown of life. Then the difficulties of this life, the trials, the tragedies will seem as nothing. Heaven will surely be worth it all. Far beyond sorrows that here befall. After this life with all its strife, heaven will surely be be worth it all.
as we sweep through the beautiful gate. And so as we consider how we overcome tragedy now, we've concerned ourselves with the question of tragedy, how we are to properly handle tragedy, and now how do we overcome it by handling it? Look at verse 3. We see Jesus. We look unto Jesus as the Hebrews writer teaches us in Hebrews chapter 12. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And He is the author of our eternal salvation. We need to look by faith unto Jesus. We need to keep our eyes on the sky as it were. We need to walk by faith in this life, not by sight. And by faith we can see Jesus coming in glory coming from his home in the sky. And here's the great news, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. If we're faithful, we shall meet him in that bright mansion. And we'll understand it all by and by. Because the trials are designed to refine our faith in him. In fact, they're designed really to bring us closer to God. And that's what God wants and hopes for, that they will do. it. But we have to choose to allow them to. We have, to, we have to allow these trials to draw us closer to God. And, and, and think about Romans 8. You, you think about Romans 8, 28. We know all things work together for good to them that love God. We know everything is not good in this life. We know that. But you know even in the bad things, God can use the adverse circumstances in life and work them together for good. Again, Joseph of old. Look at Genesis chapter 31 through 50. Jo the life of Joseph exemplifies this principle perfectly. That God can work th things together for good to them that love Him. This is a precious promise we should never forget as Christians. You see, what can separate us from the love of God? You go on down through this chapter and he talks about those physical things that can separate us. That cannot separate us. Excuse us. None of these things, death and our life, can separate us from the love of Christ. But we can separate ourselves if we choose to allow tragedy to destroy our faith. But in Christ, we are more than conquerors. You see, we don't know everything that happens in this life. We cannot know. We're, we're not God. We ask these questions, and the questions we ask are reasonable. There, there, there's nothing wrong with asking these questions. Why am I suffering? Why, why do bad things happen? We can understand to an extent why things happen. But most importantly, we can understand how to handle them. God has given us this book. You see, farther along, we'll know all about it. Farther along, we'll understand why. We think about the things that go on in this life, the things we don't know about, can't understand right now. So what can we do? Cheer up my brother, cheer up my sister, live in the sunshine. Don't allow the devil to destroy our faith. Don't allow the devil to bring the dark clouds of discouragement and pessimism into our lives. Don't allow the devil to drive a wedge between self and God don't give him that opportunity because we'll understand it all by and by may not understand it in the here and now may not understand it a month, week from now a month from now we may never understand fully why the, these things happen you think about what ha, what's occurring occurred with our brethren in Nashville they may never understand fully There are things we certainly cannot fully understand, but we can know that these things can bring us closer to God if we allow them to. And that's the point I want to leave you with this afternoon. Draw nigh unto God, and He will draw nigh unto you. Isn't that a comforting thought? But the choice is ours. What will you and I do when faced with tragedy? I hope we consider the words to the song that we've just discussed farther along. When we consider it from this perspective, it should enable us to draw nigh unto God.
to hold to its unchanging hand so that we will be building our hopes on things eternal because that's what, what it's all about is eternity having a home in heaven in eternity you think about what will not be there as we close consider this you think about all we go through in this life why we think with this farther along perspective and you go to, to Revelation 21 verse 4 what won't be in heaven why do I need to keep on keeping on why do I need to endure in this life why do I need to draw ever closer unto God every single moment because in heaven God will wipe away all our tears there will be no more death There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no more pain. Or all these things passed away. That's, what, that's, that's the end game, dear brethren. These things are but temporary. A home in heaven is eternal. So when tragedy strikes, what should we do? Draw closer to God. This afternoon, are you drawing closer to God as a Christian? If you've drawn away from God, you need to come back to God. Rededicate your life to Christ this afternoon. We encourage you to do that. As a, as a child of God, if you're hanging in there, if you're experiencing difficulties right now, if you're faithful, draw ever closer to God. Pray without ceasing. Perhaps you just need prayers of encouragement as bre bre from brethren and sisters in Christ. And we can do that. And that's what we're here for, is to help one another bear each other's burdens. But it could also be the case you're here this afternoon and you've never obeyed the gospel. We would encourage you to do that this evening. Having heard the word, do you believe it? Believe it enough to turn from your sin, to repent, your, repent of those sins, to confess your faith in Christ to be buried with him in baptism for the remission of your sins. Be added by the Lord to his church this afternoon. If you need to do that, we'll help you become a part of God's family this afternoon. If you need to be restored, if you've heard, do that as well. But if you need encouragement as a faithful child of God, we'll pray with you and for you as well. Whatever the need you may have, the invitation is extended as together we stand, as we sing.